in a new theme this morning, and I'm calling it Lessons from the Potter's House. In Jeremiah 18 and 5, God told Jeremiah, who was coming to him because of the condition of the, the backslidden state of Israel at the time, and they were in terrible shape. They were apostate. They had fallen uh, away from God. And as Jeremiah is seeking the face of the Lord about the nation, he sees the nation of Israel in a state of irreparable disrepair. He doesn't know how they can get right with God. They're so far gone. Um, and he's concerned that what God's begun won't be finished and, and that all that he has done through Jeremiah's forefathers from Abraham on will be lost. And so God wants to speak to Jeremiah, and as he does so often in our life, he, he points to an illustration in life. And so God tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and just watch the potter. And he says, and I'll speak to you while you're watching the potter. So here's the account of it. Um, I'm going to read it out of the New English Translation. Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 5. The Lord said to Jeremiah, Go down at once to the potter's house. I will speak to you further there. So I went down to the potter's house, and I found him working at his wheel. Now and then, there would be something wrong with the pot that he was molding from the clay with his hands. So he would rework the clay into another kind of pot as he saw fit. Then the Lord's message came to me. So you understand, he went down to the potter's house. He noticed what was going on. The thing that stood out to him was that God would, the potter, would make a pot. But in the making of it, there would be a flaw. And in the King James Version, it says the pot was marred. It was marred. It was flawed in the hand of the potter, so he made it again. Um, in the uh, New English translation, it says something was wrong with the pot that he was molding uh, from the clay with his hands, so he would rework the clay. King James says he made it again. So the, there was something wrong with the pot. It was marred. And the New Living Translation, I like, uh, I like a phrase it uses in verse 4, but the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Everybody say, started over. So, apparently there are lessons to be learned from the potter's house. And this message this morning, and, and however long the Lord has me follow this, has to do with bringing those messages out. So the basic message from the potter's house isn't about our failure to be perfect. It's about God's determination and ability to perfect us in spite of our failures. That's the real message of the father's house, or of the potter's house. Because if you, if you went and just sat quickly and looked, you'd say, oh, that potter's not very good. He made a pot and it was defective. It was marred in the hands of the potter. Something was wrong with it. But we know that God is the, the molder of human lives. And he is the potter in this analogy that he sent Jeremiah down to observe. And so there can't be something wrong with God. But isn't it odd um, that, that uh, there's an, a, an apparent abstraction in this picture, the perfect God with his perfect hand is making vessels, but there's something wrong with them. So at any rate, I hope that grabbed you. That got my attention years ago when I looked at this message. So the first thing that I want you to think about is that this, this message, whatever it is, from the potter's house, it's not about your failures. It's about... God's ability and his determination to perfect you beyond your failures, in spite of your failures. He has an ability to remake us. Something that doesn't happen in life can happen on the potter's wheel. 
In other words, the potter's not creating perfection, he's perfecting creation. That's what the potter's doing. The potter's not making a perfect vessel. The potter is perfecting the vessel that he has created. Which leads me to want to talk for a few minutes about the difference between abilities and pliability. Because God forms vessels for certain works. You think about in your mind, you can see a vessel that's made to hold milk or liquid. There's a vessel made to hold a platter of tacos and vessels made for, I see the nodding going on, praise the Lord. Um, but at any rate, so God forms these vessels for, for various purposes, for, for very specific works. But it's in the forming of the vessel that the flaws are revealed. So God is making a vessel for a perfect purpose, but in the pursuing of that perfection in the purpose, your imperfection comes to the surface and is revealed. And yet the whole process is a message to us about how God perfectly completes his purposes. So God chooses you not for your ability, he chooses you apparently for your pliability. As long as you're pliable, God can get you to where you need to be. But too many of us are looking for perfection in our own lives and becoming discouraged when those flaws show up. And God says, just remain pliable. I can add the perfection. That's where the perfection comes from. God's message at the potter's house revealed a supernatural power that only God himself possesses. The heavenly potter possesses a unique ability, the ability to remake a marred pot. I sat and I thought a long time about this analogy. And I had friends many years ago who were professional potters. And we used to have prayer meetings and gathering at their house and they had a shed out behind their house where they had the whole operation, the potter's wheel, and they would uh, make these uh, uh, very expensive pottery wares and then sell them around the country, and they made a living doing that. But I used to um, enjoy just watching the process. And in the process, I saw the, the, the transformation of a lump of clay into a workable, moldable lump, put upon the wheel, and then the process of beginning to drive those thumbs down into that clay, pull that pot up, form that formation, make that vessel. But then once it was made and it was finished, it was formed and then finished, it was then fired in the kiln. Once it was fired, there was no going back. It was what it was. That's how we see the making of pottery that's how we perceive our lives in this world. But God was trying to say something to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was concerned about the nation of Israel. Israel had been formed. Israel had a government. Israel had a military. Had many generations. And had a behavior and had a tangent on which it had pursued Whatever it was that it was pursuing, it took them away from God. It would seem that the pot of Israel was, had already been in the kiln and was producing bad fruit. It was a marred vessel. And so God said to Jeremiah, I want you to go down and I want you to notice something that cannot occur, cannot occur in the hands of men. It cannot occur in history. You cannot come back from the kiln after you have been made and formed and fired and be remade. But with God, all things are possible. With God, our life is an endless process of being turned and formed and reformed and molded upon that wheel. Perfection may not be evident when you look at your life in the mirror today, but it's on its way. Because perfection is in the one whose hand is on your life. Somebody say, praise the Lord. So God chooses you not for your ability. 
but he chooses you for your pliability. No matter how old you are, no matter how many reformations you have gone through, it doesn't matter. God is still working to get you where he wants you to be. Praise the Lord. That's the supernatural potter. His ability to remake the marred pot is a miracle. But it's a reality in this life where miracles like that do not exist. When something is wrong with your formation, God can reform you. And even if you're old and think that you're brittle, have been through the fire, haven't had a major change in your life in decades, when you go down to the potter's house and you let Jesus' hands be upon you, he'll soften you back into clay. He will do what life cannot do and he will reform and he will remake you. Somebody say, praise the Lord. You know, I think about this and I think, I thank God that I'm not stuck at my adolescent formation. Think of what you look like at 18. Think of what form, what kind of vessel you were at 17 or at 19. You see, the unsaved in the world, they are shaped by the hands of men, hardened in the fire of sin by the end of their teen years. And then they live the remainder of their lives with brittle flaws, with no hope of ever reversing that process and going back. They were fired in the furnace of sin, and those flaws were made permanent. Think about it in life. People can change occupations, but they don't change what they are. Can the leopard change its spots? The prophet rhetorically asks in the Old Testament. With men, Jesus told the Pharisees, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. The sinner is a pot that is fired in sin, flawed and brittle, but the Christian lives on the potter's wheel, held tight in the hands of Jesus, pliable, hopeful, and listen to this, accepted by the expectation of the potter. Think of that phrase for a moment. You are not only pliable in the hands of Jesus. You are not only warm and loved and secure in the hands of Jesus, the potter, but you are accepted based on the expectation of the potter, not on how many flaws you have, how many flaws you don't have, but there is a mind attached to those hands. There is a heart attached to those hands. And in the mind of the potter, you are the finished work. He sees you in Christ. He sees there is nothing he cannot do with your life. He sees that he can form you up as long as you remain in Jesus Christ. There is no limit to what God can do in your life. So you are accepted, not based on a snapshot in time, how many flaws you seem to have or don't have, or if God were to take a snapshot judgment of your life, you'd want to turn one way and say, get my good side. Let the, let the flaw be hidden from the snapshot. But God says, don't worry about it, because I don't take snapshots. We are relating it's an ongoing living picture, your relationship with God. It's not just a snapshot. The Lord doesn't throw you into a furnace, harden you, and that's it. You are what you are. But there is an apparent contradiction that the hands of the perfect potter can form up a pot. We would expect magic to take place and any air pockets or air bubbles, we would figure God would have gotten them all out. But it's in the pressing and the pulling and the forming up of that material, of that clay, that the deeply hidden pockets of air, those bubbles, those imperfections, 
those materials that might have been unseen in that clay that the pressing and the preparation didn't reveal, they come out. They show up. They show up as resistance to the formation, to the fine finishing that he's trying to do. He brings the tool at the edge of the rim and he's carving out the lines and the rings in your life, making you perfect. And then, boop, he hits a snag. Boop, there's an air pocket. Boop, there's a problem. And the Lord does say, well, I guess this is what we've got to work with. But the Lord says, well, I'll just pull this little thing out. I'll mash it down. We'll press this air out. And we'll just consider this is progress. We're moving forward. I'll redo this process and that air bubble will be gone because I will have worked it out. Somebody say praise the Lord. So the apparent contradiction that the hand of a perfect God can form marred vessels, that contradiction is answered by the potter's process and power over the clay. Hallelujah. In simple terms, God isn't finished with you. So the contradiction has no power because God isn't finished with you. On the potter's wheel, the process of, of perfecting you, of forming you, reveals your imperfections. God is making a perfect work, but your imperfections keep showing up. Don't get discouraged. That's the will of God. That's exactly what God wants to have happen. He wants in the process of perfecting you, your imperfections to show up. Just as we are taking shape on God's wheel and we're ready to take our place in His service, a vessel of honor, perfect in our formation, oop, out pop our outrageous disfigurations. <laughs> out pops the ugliness. Out pops the dysfunction. This vessel isn't going to work. It, in, it has inherent dysfunction in it. It can't work like that. Don't be discouraged. The dysfunctionality of your forming to this point is only evidence that God is not finished with you yet. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Don't be discouraged. Take heart. God is not an industrialist running an assembly line. God is an artist creating signature one-offs. Hallelujah. He has his personal hand on you. You're not part of an assembly line. You are not part of mass production, a mold being stamped out. You are a one-off. With his very own hand, he is applying the tools of his word to your life. And you are a signature one-off. He, he will sign your life with his very person. In Psalm 138 and verse 8, the psalmist said, The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you have made me. David, even in the Old Testament, he looks ahead and he sees Jesus coming into the world. He sees the hand of the potter. He understands that God is working out a lifelong process in his life. And he knows that the very moment that God put his hand on his life, that he became God's project. Praise the Lord. And he knew that God had a plan. That that hand was attached to a mind that had a plan, a heart that had a purpose. He said, I am yours, and your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me. See, he sees that God with me, the hand working through the pressures of life to mold me and to form me. Hallelujah. That's God working with me. He says, don't abandon me, for you have made me. I am yours. You have made me. I want to introduce you to the potter this morning. I want you to meet the one whose hand is molding your life. 
Because the coming of Jesus into the world over 2,000 years ago was the manifestation of the Father's heart in the potter's hand. Imagine if the people of Israel had realized in the moment that they saw Jesus that he was indeed the heavenly potter. He was the eternal I am, the almighty God. If they had known that, they would have been listening intently and watching everything he did to get some read, some idea of what is God's heart towards humanity. Where is he? What's his heart? What's his attitude? And they would have seen this beautiful pattern The wicked manifest in the Pharisees. Jesus reproved them because they weren't on the potter's wheel. They had jumped off the potter's wheel. They were the people who put their trust in the power and the government of men. They got all of their significance from one another. They weren't anywhere near the potter's wheel. But the broken and the common, the everyday people saw themselves on that potter's wheel and hoped that the potter had a compassionate heart attached to that hand that was pressing and forming in their lives. The Pharisees had taught them that God is an angry God. God is a vindictive God, a pernicious God. That God cannot be trusted because at any moment, your offensive flaws could send you flinging from that potter's wheel and thrown uh, in, the, uh, in the, the backyard garbage dump where all the broken pots go. But what they really saw was they saw Jesus. Jesus is the hand of God's heart. He is the manifestation of God's hand upon the potter's wheel. If you remember, the hand of God on Peter's life spoke to him when Peter first met Jesus. And Peter saw Jesus' mercy in the face of, of Peter's aggravation. Lord, we've been fishing all night. What do you mean drop my nets? Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just a preacher. I'm a fisherman. I know these waters. We fished all night. There's nothing in here. Blah, blah, blah. After he got done saying, Jesus said, just... Go out a little bit, just drop your net. All right, Lord. Nevertheless, at your word. And Peter knew. Peter knew if, if Jesus had been just an ordinary person, he would have come up with nothing. And, but when he encircled that net full of fish, that net breaking, by the time he got them to shore, he realized this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And he felt ashamed of himself. And in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, I could see Jesus putting his arm around Peter's shoulder. And it says, Jesus replied to Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. I want to introduce you to the potter. The, the potter, Jesus, is proof that God will Form you for great purposes that are beyond your ability. But he will be with you and stay with you through the process. He will be with you all the way. And so Jesus spent three and a half years walking with Peter, putting up with Peter, guiding Peter, kept his hand on Peter's life. Even afterwards, the Holy Spirit came and the Holy Spirit had his hand on Peter. Peter went through his life and those ugly little marred spots and flaws kept popping up and showing up, but God kept working with him. And guess what? Peter became the vessel. And all through the process, it's the miracle of the potter's house that God can use you without you being hardened, without you being fired and hardened into a state fixed and unable to be changed. God uses people in process, people who are in a process of change. 2 Corinthians 4 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, so that the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. 
The very message of Jesus to the world is look. Look at Glenn. Look at Giselle. Look at Kathy. Look at Elise and Jeff. And see that I am working with people in progress. I can bring a perfect result out of imperfect vessels. And I'm still working with them. Praise the Lord. The power of your life's light doesn't emanate from your forming. It emanates from the one whose hand is on your life, pressing down into your soul and forming and molding you. How many remember the old song? I think, uh, I think Pete Seeger wrote it in the 50s, and then it was made popular by the birds in the 60s. Turn, turn, turn. And they quoted Ecclesiastes. I shared that as a text a couple of weeks ago. To every thing, to every purpose, there is a time and a season. To every purpose under heaven, turn, turn, turn. Well, the words turn, turn, turn don't show up in Ecclesiastes. Um, the, the author of that song saw kind of like the potter's wheel. Turning, the turning of life, the seasons of life. And I got to thinking about that, and I got to thinking about the potter's wheel, and the rotation, and the, the, the direction that the potter's wheel takes is just one of constant cyclical motion, habitual revolution. Mankind, people, measure their lives by linear measurements of history. This is where I started. This is where I'm at. This is where I'm heading. They look at history and the, the short run, their own life, their family. This is when my family came to this country and the generation before me and the generation I'm now living and now my children. And they tend to look at, at that linear kind of progression. And, and we like to, we as, as people, natural people, we, we like to draw our sense of significance or success from those linear progressions. I was here, now I'm here. Oh, I started out here, but now look at me, I'm messed up. I, we monthly go to these Christian kind of uh, AA meetings, celebrate recovery. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a Christian AA. And listen to these testimonies of people whose whose testimony oftentimes is, I came into the world here, took three steps, and ended up in the garbage dump and spent 20 years walking through this mess in life until the Lord began to pull me out. We, we look at life and progress as this linear sort of progression. So we, we take our identity from the events. We oftentimes... Look at ourselves on the greater timeline of history, the increments of history, and our forefathers, and we project where we think everything is heading. But in reality, our soul doesn't move along a linear line. Our soul does not progress through the increments and the events of history. Our souls revolve in a cyclical, seasonal, and habitual pattern. The soul is always in a rotation. We may be impacted by the glancing blows of history sent spinning off into changeless tangents that seem never to end. Think about the person who says, yeah, you know, this happened to me when I was a kid and I've never gotten over it. This impact in my history hit me. This, I came back from that war and I was different. I've never been able to get back the innocence that I was. Um, and so we become impacted by the blows of history that intersect us. But in reality, in actuality, it's the repetitive passes through the potter's hand, round and around, that actually open us up, pull us up into shape, and form us as vessels of God's glory. 
It's not either the wars, the acceptance, the rejection, the successes, or the failures, or any other thing in life that impacts you that actually makes you what you are. What really makes you what you are is the revolution, the tight cyclical pattern every day. Think about it. People can be poor and be rich, and they're the same people when they're rich 20 years later after they became poor. They haven't changed. They are still as selfish, or they're still as uh, benevolent. They're still as loud, or they're still as quiet. They still are, because only God and the potter hands upon your life on that sacred wheel can really change your soul. The fortunes or misfortunes in life have nothing to do whatsoever with the quality of what you are. They don't change you that much. They just change your trajectory. And so it really is vanity for people whose collision with history or fortune has put them at a higher trajectory than people at a low trajectory. It's vanity for them to, to lord over others who are under them because the fact is, is they may be 10 times worse than the people that are under them. You are what you are on the potter's wheel and some people never reach that wheel. That's why our message is come to Jesus so that he can put you on his wheel and remake that pot, praise the Lord. Are you beginning to get what I'm, where we're going with this thing? Hallelujah. Now, the world turns just like the potter's wheel. The world rotates. The world spins, actually physically spins on its axis. But, but life is seasonal. There is rotation in this world. But it turns without providing any change. People go through the seasons of life. They don't change. They stay the same. The wheel of time only plasters cosmetics over the flaws and cracks and damages of our life. It never changes the essence of the pot because that pot's fired. It's hardened. And so the rotation of life simply spackles the cracks and can offer no real change whatsoever. But only Jesus, the heavenly potter, has the power to remake the marred pot. That's what God was saying when he told Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house and I will speak to you. You need a different orientation. You're looking at the nation of Israel. You're seeing them hardened in a particular direction. But God said, I can work with people, I can work with individuals, I can work with a whole nation. I am able to take the marred, I'm able to take the imperfect, I'm able to take the ugly, and I can put them on the potter's wheel, and I can remake them. I love those phrases that we had in the beginning. Something was wrong with the pot he was molding. So he reworked the clay. Only Jesus can rework the clay. The pot was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again. So simple. He made it again. Life can't do that, but Jesus can make it again. I love the other one that says, the jar didn't turn out as he hoped. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. If you look at yourself in the mirror and said, I got saved, but I look at myself now. I'm not where I think I should be. I, and, and I don't think I'm what God was hoping for. The Bible goes on to say, the pot didn't turn out as the potter had hoped, so he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Hallelujah. A do-over. Think about it. Praise God. Don't be weary. With the do-overs, let God remake the clay. Let God rework your life. Hallelujah. It really is what that famous verse is all about in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any person is in Christ, they're a new creation. <clears throat> Listen to the phrase, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Think for a moment. 
What was the old? The old was the transfixed condition of changelessness. The new is what? The ever continuing remaking, the constant reforming. In other words, the new never gets old because the reforming never ends. God is constantly making and improving us. Hallelujah. So in the potter's hands, the new has come. It never becomes old. And the flaws never define the vessel. The mind and the hand of the potter is what defines the vessel. Turn off your devices. Close your Bible. Stand with me. Let's respond to this word this morning. There are some other wonderful lessons to be learned at the potter's house. I'll share them next week. But uh, right now, let's make a commitment to stay on the wheel. Don't allow linear events of life to condemn you. Don't allow them to give you false vision or concept of where you're at. You are your value in the hands of the potter. That's where your value lies, is in the hands of Jesus. Hallelujah.